Our Father, how we thank you for the confidence that you hear us and that you know a better than we know how to ask. And so, Lord, we are confident that you've heard these are prayers and that in your wisdom, in your great love, in your power. You will answer these are prayers in ways that bring glory to you and that are for our good. And we thank you that you not only hear us, but that you speak to us. And you do so through your word. And so we ask that as we turn our attention to that word which you have spoken, and as we reflect on it this day, uh, that you would bring its truth home to our hearts. Draw any to Jesus who do not know him. We ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. If you are able, out of reverence for God's word, please stand as we uh, turn in our lectionary reading this morning to Isaiah 58, the first uh, nine verses, and then <clears throat> to Matthew, the fifth, uh, fifth chapter. Shout it aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its gods, of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why are, have we humbled ourselves <clears throat> and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers, your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? To set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear, and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. And then our New Testament reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, uh, verses 13 through, uh, 13 through uh, 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its, its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled upon by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Four months ago, uh, the Pew Research Center published an article entitled, In the United States, Decline of Christianity Continues at Rapid Pace. And here are just a few pull quotes. <clears throat> The religious landscape of the United States continues to change at a rapid clip. In Pew Research Center telephone surveys conducted in 2018 and 19, 65% of American adults described themselves as Christians when asked about their religion, down 12 percentage points over the last decade. Meanwhile, the religiously unaffiliated share of the population consisting of people who describe their religious identity as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular 
now stands at 26%, up from 17 in 209. The data, the data shows that just like rates of religious affiliation, rates of religious attendance are declining. Over the last decades, a share of Americans who say they attend religious services at least once or twice a month dropped by seven percentage points, while the share who say they attend religious services less often, if at all, has risen by the same degree. Furthermore, the data shows a wide gap between older Americans, baby boomers, and members of the silent generation, and millennials in their levels of religious affiliation and attendance. More than eight in 10 members of the silent generation, those born between 1928 and 1945, describe themselves as Christians, 84%, as do three quarters of baby boomers, 76%. In stark contrast, only half of millennials, 49%, describe themselves as Christians. Four in 10 are religious nuns, and one in 10 millennials identify with non Christian faiths. I came across an article just uh, this past week that was written about two years ago, and the title was On Being a Millennial Pastor. And he relates how, as he became ordained and went through the process, that uh, the older pastors were so happy to see him as a young pastor. And he kept hearing from them, you give us hope for the future. He was kind of mystified uh, by this until he realized that he had no memory of the glory days that they did. The full title of this article is, On Being a Millennial Pastor, Leaders Who Don't Remember the Glory Days. And this is what he writes. He talks about how the, these pastors kept talking to him and saying how they, they were so happy to have a young pastor and there was hope for the future. He said, and then as I had yet on another conversation with colleagues or parishioners or other church folk lamenting the absence of young people, the decline of attendance and giving, and the general sad state of the present church, it dawned on me. These people are grieving. As soon as I could see it, it was like pulling back the veil and seeing the weight being carried by nearly everyone around me, everyone of a certain age, that is. The glory days were gone. The days when pews were full, Sunday schools bursting at the seams, programs well attended, giving was enough to pay the bills and increasing. When every family had 4.2 kids and a housewife, who would devote volunteer time to the church or keep the house in check while her husband did. Those days were over. But it wasn't just that those days were over. It was the intense desire to bring them back. Churches, pastors, leaders who'd, who could remember those days seemed to be universally bound and determined to somehow bring that glory back, get the young people back, get the families back, Fill the pews, resurrect the Sunday schools, meet and exceed budgets. I think there is a longing for those of us who are old enough to remember to, if I may adapt a campaign slogan from a certain American president, make the church great again. Now, it is this same longing for the glory days that we see in our Old Testament lectionary reading today. This passage in Isaiah 58 is from the latter portion of the prophecy of Isaiah. And he has been speaking about the coming judgment in the earlier parts, and now he's looking to the future, and he's looking ahead to the promised deliverance and restoration of Israel after God's judgment on her. Israel is seen as redeemed from a Babylonian bondage, but not restored to her former glory. And so, they're seeking God's favor. They're seeking God's blessing. They want God to make Israel great again. And so here in Isaiah 58, we find the people. They're in prayer. They're fasting. They are seriously pursuing God. And yet... God is not restoring them to their former glory. 
They're puzzled. They're disappointed. And in the text, we see them asking why. And God answers forcefully through the prophet. God tells the prophet in verse 1, shout aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. And then God begins to take the people to task for their daily lives which don't match their worship. See, Israel is unhappy with God. She believes that she is taking God seriously. She claims that she's seeking out the Lord so as to know his ways. She asserts that she asks God for direction and for answers. She points to her fasting as evidence of her earnestness. We see this in verses 2 through 3a. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if there were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near to them. Why? Why have we fasted, they say? Why have you not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed it? But God answers them. And he answers them by unmasking their hypocrisy. We see that in the second part of verse 3 through 5. He says, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. And you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked feasts. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself. They were taking advantage of the weak and of the powerless. They were arrogant, they were self-serving, and they were ready to fight for whatever it was they wanted. They're humble one day, but they're arrogant the next. Then God tells them how to make Israel great again, how to return to the glory days. Listen again to verses 6 through 9, which we read just a minute, just a bit ago, but then I want to go on through verse 12. And listen to, what, listen to what the Lord says. Is it only for the bowing? Is this, and is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call on the Lord, and he will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression and the pointing finger and the malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves... In behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide your ways. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fall, uh, uh, never, never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and you and will raise up the age-old foundations you will be called repair of broken walls the restore of streets with uh, um, of, of streets with with dwellings be concerned he says about those that are suffering unjustly be concerned for the poor and for their needs feed the hungry clothe the naked then says God, your light will break forth, the glory of God will shine in your midst, your prayers will be answered, the glory days will be restored, and you will be a great again. Now, these words to Israel must not fall on deaf ears in the American church about which we were reading just before. I hear a lot, perhaps, I hear a lot of complaints about how the church is ignored and how it's marginalized. I hear a lot of concerns about religious liberty. I hear about how the evangelicals need to flex their political muscles. 
I even hear about the need to pray for our country. In fact, there's even a national movement to pray and fast for America. This is uh, from a, a, one of the sites, Pray and Fast for America 2020. Pray and Fast for America is a grassroots movement of Catholics and Christians from around the country participating in a nationwide network of prayer and fasting. This movement was founded at the end of 2017 as a coalition group of the 26th International Week of Prayer and Fasting felt inspired to call for 365 days of masses and prayers and fasting for our president, leaders, families, and the church. The first Prayer and Fast for America initiative was held in 2018. Due to the response of so many people to this initiative and the accelerating, accelerating moral devastation that is occurring into our, in our country, especially the calls to infanticide in more and more states, Prayer and Fast for America has called the American people to intercede for the repentance and healing of our nation. For 2020, prayer, Pray and Fast for America has decided to pray for the conversion, divine guidance, and wisdom of our political and church leaders. For this reason, we ask you to join priests, deacons, religious, and lay people from all over the United States. Now, who is going to argue with praying and fasting for America? I don't know. Maybe God? Now, America is not ancient Israel. And despite what some folk think, we are not the chosen, we are not God's chosen people. No, God's chosen people is the church. And if we want the church to be great again, we need to look inward, not outward. This is what we see in our New Testament reading today. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth, but... If the salt loses its saltiness, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled upon by men. So I would submit from what Jesus says here that if the church feels marginalized and if the church feels that it is being trampled on, then it may well be that it is no longer salty. Maybe the problem isn't primarily with the culture. Maybe the problem is with the church itself. Now, it's no coincidence, of course, that um, verse 14 of, um, of Matthew 5 follows verse 13. And there we read these words. You, can, you are the light of the world, and a city on a hill cannot be hidden. So in 13, Jesus says you're the salt of the earth. In verse 14, he says you're the light of the world. A salty church, that is, is a light-shedding church. And what is, a, what is that salty light? Well, we see that in verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Good deeds. Now, Jesus doesn't spell out in this text what the good deeds are, but you just can't read the Gospels without seeing his concern for the unjustly oppressed and for the poor. Listen to, listen to Luke as he records the launching of Jesus' public ministry in Luke 4, 14 and following. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, and as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed him, Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the, of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's the first description of the ministry of Jesus. When John the Baptist wavered in his confidence as to whether Jesus was the Messiah, he sent his disciples to Jesus. Uh, and he said, uh, he said uh, ask them, are, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? And Jesus replied to their question in 7.22, uh, so he replied to the messengers, go back 
and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Well, we could go on. But God tells Israel, and in so doing, tells the church, that all of your religious activity, all of your prayers and fasting, is now what is going to make the church great again. The path to greatness in the church is the pathway of mercy and compassion, of freedom from oppression, of care for the poor and the marginalized. Now, there's a great deal that could be said regarding the church at large here, but I want us just to hear it grace for us to take this uh, to heart. And I want to say that I'm grateful to be in a church where we are seeking to live out our unity in Christ. Our, re- our recent Epiphany readings um, have addressed the, uh, the, the strife that was in the church in Corinth, and we take seriously the call of Isaiah 58 not to quarrel, not to live in strife, not to metaphorically even strike each other with wicked fists. And we take this especially seriously as we come to the table of our Lord each month. We seek to resist the oppression that is felt because of the color of one's skin. Our church has people from many different racial backgrounds and with cultural distinctives. And all can be leaders in our congregation. We seek to provide for the poor through many means. We have deacons that, unlike many churches where they're tasked with the care of the physical concerns of the buildings and grounds here at Grace, they're tasked with the ministry of mercy uh, within and without the church. But may I, in the uh, twilight of my pastoral ministry here at Grace, call on this wonderful church to continue and to deepen its ministry of mercy. As we at Grace and as the church at large in America, as we give ourselves in behalf of the hungry and seek to satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then we can look to the Lord on behalf of the church for growth, for success, for impact in this country uh, to his glory. As the church gives itself to the poor and to the oppressed, it will point to the justice and to the mercy of God, which is actually on full display at the cross of Jesus because there he died in our place to fulfill and to satisfy the justice of God which condemned us. And there Jesus paves the way for God to be both just and merciful to all who believe. And it is this kindness and this mercy of God for us in Jesus that he calls us to live out as his people, the church. So may we as individuals, as a particular church, and as part of the church here in America, may we be convicted where needed. May the power of God the Holy Spirit, given through repentance and faith, be unleashed in our lives and in our church and in the church as we fast the kind of fasting that God has chosen. May our light rise in the darkness and our night become like the noonday so that the church in America can indeed Uh, be great again. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we 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 acknowledge uh, before you that particularly uh, particularly in our in our country uh, it is very easy as we heard earlier in our call uh, to worship to worship other things uh, in our in our lives and to be consumed with ourselves rather than with you and with your glory and the glory of of your church. And we do lament uh, the uh, condition of, of, our, of, of the church here in this country as it is in decline. We are thankful for your church that is growing exponentially in other parts of the world. And we pray, Father, that uh, you would visit your people again, that you would bring a conviction uh, to all of, to our hearts, and that we might, uh, we might be a, a church, a people, that is known not merely for what it is against, but what it is for and how it seeks to actually touch in, in, in deep and significant and meaningful ways the lives of those around us, uh, the lives of those who are hurting. So guide us and direct us to this end, 
And we pray that uh, indeed our light, the light of your church, might rise in the darkness of our nation and that the night become like the noonday in your church. We ask it for your glory. Amen.